be before I begin, so I, I don't really have any idea of how well everybody here in the room knows DNS or not. So um, is anyone, who, who's here read any DNS RFCs or a few, okay. So who, who sort of roughly thinks um, they understand DNSSEC, how it, how it works? Okay, so very few, okay. So I will try to race through some of it, but uh, again, if something is not clear or if I go too fast, um, feel free to catch me anytime today or tomorrow, and I'm happy to, uh, to sit down with you. Okay, so DNS and ITF. Um, so DNSSEC is the process, it was actually the working group was called DNSX, DNS extensions, but they were working on DNSSEC, and so it took uh, over 10 years, I think, um, to finally come up with something that, uh, that worked well enough that you know, we, we deployed it. So I'll talk briefly about DNSSEC and how it works. Um, Deprive is the working group that is uh, uh, still active, but it's about to be done with all of its deliverables. It's about encrypting the DNS and giving pri DNS privacy in general. So we'll see that there are some other things we can do as well to increase the privacy of DNS. Um, DNS Ops is the working group where all the day-to-day -day things happen. You can imagine that there's like, you know, many attacks against DNS and servers and new extensions. Um, so for all the, the, the minor new work to, the, to, to accomplish like the operational things, um, that still happens in DNS ops. Um, they usually get two slots at the IETF because they have too much to talk about. Um, and so there's like, you know, five or six hours of DNS uh, talk happening at an IETF meeting. Um, and aside from that, they also uh, a couple of years ago started something called DNS OARC, which is basically sort of a mini IHF only for DNS. So it's like one or two days of only uh, fully dedicated to DNS. They usually hold them around um, an IETF or an ICANN meeting or a NANOC meeting in North America. So usually people can combine these two. Uh, these two. Um, and then there's Dane. The Dane working group is also about to close. This was all about using DNS as a PKI because once you've used DNSSEC to sign all the DNS records, you can then put other things in there like public keys and other information that you can now trust because you can verify with the DNSSEC that is actually um, authenticated and comes from the actual publisher. Um, and so you, there's a few uh, record types. Uh, TLSA is the most important record type that uh, that came out. It's basically storing a public key or a certificate in DNS. So you can it can either be a hash of a certificate or the certificate itself, or just a public key. And it, depending on the location where in a DNS it is, it, it will apply to a web server or a mail server, uh, etc. So um, so you can have your mail server certificate published in DNS, protected by DNSSEC, and then an incoming mail client connecting to it and then verify that you're actually talking to your mail server before they deliver the email over TLS. Um, and in fact, the Dutch and German government have put this on their list of mandated for government use. So, um, so this is actually getting traction. Um, Open PGP key is one to publish PGP keys. So you can pull my key from the DNS and confirm with DNSSEC that it's my key. And then you can send me encrypted messages. Um, and there's a similar one for SMIME called SMIME A. And a really old one uh, is IPSECI. That was actually uh, not from the Dane Working Group, from, but from before. Um, and that's actually to publish um, IPSEC public keys for IP addresses, and then um, you can actually encrypt all the traffic to an IP address, uh, even though you have no prior configuration with them. <clears throat> um, if you want a good reading about uh, DNS terminology, um, because there's some weird terms in there. Um, you know, authoritative, and uh, it's not authoritative, but authoritative, um, recursive name servers, caching name servers, and all these terms are our type, uh, are our sets. Uh, they all get sort of confusing. Um, and so there's a good uh, DNS terminology um, document that's been recently published. Uh, so I recommend you read through that if you want to sort of increase your basic knowledge of DNS. It's a really good document. Um, and they're working on a BIS document. So the first one was, um, capture all the things that are sort of scattered throughout the RFCs and bring them in one document as sort of a definition document. And then we found that there were actually a lot of gaps in there or there were a lot of contradictions where a term was used in one RFC meaning something and in another RFC it meant something else. And so the BIS document is going to be the successor where we actually address these problems. Okay, so this is DNSSEC in one slide. Um, we wanted it to be backwards compatible. So everything we did 
had to be backwards compatible to DNS servers that did not understand DNSSEC. So the first thing was all the new things we put into the DNS to make this happen had to be itself a DNS record so that all the old software could just serve the record without knowing it. Then we put a new bit in the query that said, if you enable this bit, then I know DNSSEC, you can give me all the additional data that I need to do DNSSEC validation. And again, that just means getting multiple new DNS records. So what are these records? DNS key is the first record. That's basically the public key record. So um, if I want to publish for reddit.com, if I sign that with DNSSEC, uh, publish the public key into a DNS key record that's published at reddit.com. So the type of the record is DNS key. Our RSIC is the actual signature. It's also in the form of a DNS record. Um, so if you query for an A record in a signed zone and you say, I want DNSSEC information, then you get two records back in your end. So one is the A record and the other one is the RRSIC record. And then you can take the signature and verify it against the public key. If you don't have the public key, you might have to do an additional query to get the public key. But at some point, all of that will be, will, will be in your cache. And then, because the system is meant so that the name server does not have to do any crypto operation itself, the only thing it does is take records and serve it. There was this one additional problem where if you ask for something that doesn't exist, how do you prove that something doesn't exist with a signature without knowing beforehand all the millions of possible queries that people can give you? So if they query for something that doesn't exist, there's a trick, you return an NSEC or an NSEC3 record. An NSEC record, what basically happens is you make a linked list of all the domain names that do exist in the zone. And then you, uh, so each NSEC record points from one to the next. And then the next record goes from the next to the next. So from A to B, from B to C. And so you got a linked list. So if something doesn't exist, you ask for paul.reta.com, you will get an NSEC record that basically says, okay, between, you know, between O and R, there's no record that starts with a P. So this is, this is the record that proves that. Um, that was a little bit uh, awkward for some people because it allows you to enumerate the whole zone. You can get basically this linked list like a record basically represents all your data. So they made one where um, uh, instead of sorting the entries, you sort the hashes. So you hash it first and then sort it. So if you ask for paul.reta.com um, and you get an NSEC3 record back, you basically take paul.reta.com, hash it according to the salt and stuff in the, in the record that you got, and then see that it falls in between those two sorted hashes. Um, and then the last record is the delegation signing record, the DS record. That actually links the parent to the child. So in the root zone for, uh, for uh, India, there's a DS record that says, you know, expect this public key to sign for everything in .in. And then within India, you would have the same thing for the subzone. So you build this chains of DS records that you get to the, the zone where you are. And the DS record is just a hash of the DNS key record you expect in a child zone. So now we've basically got a list from the root down to anywhere in the tree in the hierarchy. You can go down and you can chain all of this together and you can get a validated answer from the top down to your domain. Um, so yeah, so this is basically DNSSEC on one slide. Um, I've, if you Google for my name and DNSSEC, you'll find some more elaborate presentations where I go into a little more detail. Um, so then uh, one issue that came up recently why, why um, I'm mentioning it here is that uh, the root key was about to roll over. So the root key, since it's the top key, it's the only one that's hard coded in your software because there's no other place to get it. Like you can get it from a website, signed by ICANN, certificates and everything, but um, there's, still, there's still the bootstrap. So um, this one is shipped with all the DNS software, but now when we roll the key, um, because you know, once in a while you want to be able to go to a new key. You want to be, able to, let's say that there's a compromise and we must roll to a new key. We want to be, make sure that this can actually happen. So this this rollover it was not an emergency. It was just a planned exercise to see if we can do this. Um, and it turns out um, rolling is really hard because you have to talk to your parent because you need to update that DS record. So what most zones do is they split it in two. They have a zone signing key and a key signing key. The zone signing key signs everything in the zone. The key signing key only signs the keys. So now within your own zone, so let's say within reddit.com, we can change the key that signs all the data in our zone and we don't have to tell anybody else because that's not the key that links to the .com. That key is the key signing key and that one we only roll once a year or once every three years. Uh, some people decide to not roll at all until there's a reason for it. Um, but of course, again, for the root, this doesn't work because the root is only, it's the top, it's hard-coded. 
Um, so there's one mechanism in RFC 5011 that specifies how you could do this automatically. So you basically add a second key, then you have the first one vouch for the second one, and then you wait 30 days or more to make sure that this is not a hacker who just briefly compromised your system. And then after 30 days, you set the revoke bit on the old key, uh, and then everybody will automatically move to trust the new key. And then at some point you remove the old key and then you've switched the new key. So this is an automated system that could work and it has been implemented in a lot of software, but does it actually work? Well, nobody really knows because it hasn't never been tried on a root. It works on other zones, but, but the root is again, it's a special case. Um, so a little later in the process, they decided, okay, we really need some numbers on monitoring. So they decided to add two, um, two canaries to, to sort of monitor this. And this is in a really recent RFC, you can see by the number 8145. Um, basically, it's, it sends, whenever you, uh, whenever the root key expires from your cache um, and you need to query it again, you're going to also send a signal that says, oh, by the way, this is the public key that I currently trust. And by sending that, um, you, can, you can get information. Now, the problem is one of these mechanisms is hop by hop because when you ask your resolver, your resolver might not send it forward. So there was a second mechanism added where um, the resolver would just straight ask the root servers bypassing everybody. But of course, that is not always guaranteed to make it all out all the way to the top. So there's two ways of, of, of doing this. And they took these, um, this information and they tried to monitor and see if they could see anything about the adoption rate of the new key. The new key has been published, so there's a second uh, root key now in the DNS, but it's not activated yet. So the old key is still used for all the signing. The new key has just been published and added to the set. And what they found is, um, what you can see there in a, in a red circle, is that about 5% of clients actually um, were keep telling the root name servers that they were only had the old key, not the new key. So at this point, um, a couple of weeks ago, I think it was two weeks ago, I can said, okay, 5%, this is, this is, this is not good. We, can, we cannot roll the key because once we actually roll the key, those 5% will be dead in the water. So we need to figure out what's going on. Um, so they do have a, a fairly good idea of what's going on, but some of it is, is not really a solved problem. Um, so yeah, so um, they, they monitored 27,000 IP addresses um, uh, uh, that were actually sending, according to this new RFC, out of like 4.2 million resolvers that were querying them. 6% um, were not ready. Um, and, and the problem is also IP address doesn't really tell you that much either because there could be one client that is not able to upgrade that appears on multiple IP addresses, you know, every hour they get a new IP address. And so they look like a whole lot of them, but it's only one. And you have the reverse problem too, where if a resolver is behind a forwarder or there's many resolvers behind the forwarder, then it might appear that only one IP address is not going to update. But in fact, there's like, you know, a thousand behind it that are also broken and you cannot tell the difference. So this analysis is really hard and that's why they postponed it by at least three to six months and they're now working on better analyzing the situation. Um, so possible causes. Um, if you've configured bind in, in the past, um, initially when they, uh, when they added the NSSEC, um, they added a trusted key statement where you would put the key, but this would not have any update mechanism in them. So that RFC 5011 that does the automatic updating um, is not triggered by this. So this is sort of a hard-coded key in a configuration and people still have this configuration with this keyword even though the keyword has been obsoleted by the keyword managed keys, which actually does take the rollover into account to, according to RFC 5011. And so uh, suspicion is that there's a lot of people with this old configuration. And so they will break no matter how long we wait. So we don't really need to wait for them because they will be guaranteed to break anyway. Um, then there's the other problem is 5011. If you actually do roll over, you have to at some point write that new key to disk and not all setups are allowed for that. So for instance, if you run name D in a change root environment, you might not be able to have write access and it might actually fail to actually uh, do the rollover properly. Um, and then there's uh, the, the Puppet and Ansible and container type setups that always come from the same start. So even though they come up and they update themselves, uh, they're fine, but then when they launch another instance of it, it will again look as an old one that's not updated. So even though they might be updating, we might be just seeing all the old nodes being started again. So it might not be a problem because they do update, but we don't know for sure. And then it was the, 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 what's probably the biggest bug was that bind would send, so the new bind implemented this key tag sending, this, this canary sending, but it always did so uh, even when DNSSEC was disabled in the configuration.
But if it's disabled in the configuration, it wouldn't do this 5011 rollover process. So um, it would never update the key, but it would report that it has the old key, even though it didn't use the old key because DNSSEC was disabled. So we suspect that the largest group is actually this group where they um, where they're not using DNSSEC, so we can roll because they're not using it anyway. Um, but we don't know for sure yet. Um, the bind people have fixed this, so we do hope that in the next two months when all of these people on that bind version, because they are, they are on a really new bind version, because otherwise they wouldn't have this key tag support. And since they are on this newer version, we suspect that they will upgrade soon again too, and then they will get the update where bind doesn't do this. So if DNSSEC is disabled, they will not send the key tag, so we don't confuse them for uh, for old clients. <clears throat> uh, we'll skip this one for time. Um, so let's go to Deprive. So Deprive is basically using TLS um, to encrypt the DNS. Um, so there's a there's the trusted situation. Right? Let's say you trust Google and you build a TLS connection to Google to 8888 and you send all your DNS over TLS. And so the only party you have to trust is Google and all your local ISPs, your coffee shops, everybody. They won't see your DNS queries. It's all encrypted, and that's a basic, you know, improvement of the DNS uh, as it is right now. Because right now, everybody in your coffee shop can probably see your DNS packets. The coffee shop owner can for sure see it, and everybody upstream can see them as well, right? Um, so that's the stop the resolver one. And there's also the resolver to authoritative ones. So if you've got the resolver ones to ask, like the Red Hat.com servers about uh, about something inside Red Hat.com, they could also use encryption. Now that people don't find as important because these are already big resolvers, so they already don't really relate back to one individual person, um, and and so they cache it for multiple people. So it's harder to track people from like uh, from a personal information point of view. Um, so that's the the part that they still need to work on. Uh, that's not done. The other part is done. The DNS over TLS specification for a step to resolver um, has been done. Uh, Google's not running it yet, but I suspect that that they will do that. Um, and then we needed to add some DNS padding as well, because otherwise, based on the length of the DNS query, you might be able to determine maybe with luck what query it is. Like, that's probably Facebook or that's probably CNN.com. Um, so just some padding just to, to obfuscate things a little bit better. And then this is actually what turned out the thing that we should have done 20 years ago and we didn't. And it's probably the most important privacy enhancing uh, thing we've done with the DNS in the last couple of years. <clears throat> so normally what happens, and, and a lot of people actually don't know this, when you ask for something very detailed, so let's say in this case, I ask for the, I want to send an email to nohats.ca, it's my personal domain. Um, so if you want to send an email to paul at nohats.ca and you ask for the MX record of nohats.ca, um, so your client sends that to the resolver. The resolver, like let's say they start from an empty cache, when they need to find out where the MX record is for noads.ca. They don't know anything yet except the hard-coded list of root servers. So they go to a root server and say, give me the MX record of noads.ca. They're not asking for just a bit of the answer. They're saying the entire question that I asked is asked of the root server. And so the root server at this point knows that someone in the world wants to email someone at noads.ca. Um, and that's information that they really don't need because the root server can only answer where the TLDs are. So why are we giving them more information than just, hey, I'm looking for .ca, why don't you give me that? And so you, this, this process repeats again. So at the, at the CA TLD, you'll see the same. At the resolver, I ask again, please give me the MX record for noads.ca. And the CA server says, I don't know, go ask the noads people. Uh, but again, all everybody who runs the CA server can see all those queries. So what query minimization does is actually does the thing that you would probably expect it would have done already, is you only ask for that which you, which you, which you know that server is going to answer. So the root server, you only ask, give me the name server for .ca because I need the name servers for .ca. And then when you get to .ca, you go, give me the name servers for noads.ca, and they give you that. And then maybe you will also have TLS enabled to, uh, to encrypt the traffic. You might actually be able to send a TLS encrypted query to the NoHead server and then say, by the way, give me the MX record for NoHead.ca. So at this point, no one externally can even see that you were trying to send an email. Um, they just know that you asked something about NoHead.ca. And if that's, an, if that's a name server that runs 10,000 domains, then you don't even know which domain that is at that point. So this is this, the single biggest important thing. Um, it's an option in the, in, the, in, the, in the name server software. You can you can enable it for bind and unbound and other servers. 
Um, so if you run a name server for yourself, go look at this and enable this. This is this is, gives you a lot of privacy. And then um, this is the uh, the drama. I call it the drama of special names because in the last two years, about half of the time in DNS ops at ITF has been um, about this issue. And this this really came about because ICANN started launching these new generic top level domains, and so everybody. You know, could suddenly have dot pizza and dot hotel and everything uh, under the world, and so there's like you know a lot more domains now. And then some people figured out, wait, um, especially actually the, the one of the first people was the, the Tor people from uh, who want who use dot onion, right? But dot onion is not a real DNS domain. But they wanted to make sure that someone couldn't use the ICANN system and register dot onion as a real top level domain. And they found this RFC, RFC 6761. It says, you can ask the IETF to reserve a domain name. Uh, and if you have you know, good technical reasons, then you will get it. And um, that was very unfortunate because now the IETF had to make a lot of political decisions. Um, but at the IETF, we are engineers, we are technicians. Um, for anything related to lawyers, salesmen, government, please go to ICANN. That's where the money is. If you want to sue anybody, go to ICANN. That's where all the money is. IETF, we're just poor engineers. Just leave us alone. We just do technical things. And so we really didn't want to get involved in this. And, um, and the reason that RFC exists is actually because Apple jumped the gun at some point a couple of years ago. They, they stole the .local domain. And we sort of retroactively fixed it up. So you can see that the, the rendezvous, um, so the, the multicast DNS Apple RFC is RFC 6762. And 6761 is the RFC that basically gives Apple the .local domain. So you're like, okay, well, we have to fix this process. You already stole it. You're documenting it. There's no way Apple was going to switch at that point. They use .local. That's it. So we sort of try to formalize this. Okay, so we gave you permission to use .local. Okay, with this RFC, and that really, you know, bit us uh, later on when other people said, hey, I have a top level domain. I don't want to pay $185,000 to ICANN. I want .pol. Uh, can you exclude this from the DNS and give it to me? Um, and so a lot of time and effort has gone in where I think like we should be talking about the DNS protocol and not about like you know how people can get uh, domain names in the in the zone. Um, hopefully it's mostly behind us now, but uh, but I th I, there's still some talk that that's happening in this space. Uh, this is another interesting thing that's come up: the response policy zone. It's basically a DNS firewall. So the idea here is that sort of like the anti-spam services is that um, there's people who run these lists, uh, blacklists. They can be for you know um, inappropriate sites, pornography, uh, uh, talk about certain like anything that you have government censorship for uh, could be there. But also uh, all malware sites are automatically blocked. And so, so you've got these lists where you can have like blacklists uh, or whitelists. And this RPZ allows you to plug this into your DNS server so that those things don't resolve. They, you, they can go to a warning page or to some other page. So it's really a firewall for DNS. So if I go to some malware site, then a resolver I'm using can say, no, you're not, because that's insecure. Now, um, and there's, of course, a lot of money behind this because people want to offer this as commercial services. And this is the way to interoperate with all the existing um, software. So it's nice that this is a standard. It's really good um, that we can offer those services. But the problem is that it wasn't actually, because they're just rewriting the DNS on the fly, it sort of conflicts with DNSSEC. Because now I cannot um, determine the difference between an, an attacker rewriting my DNS or the good guy rewriting my DNS. And uh, I was one of the people that tried to force them into um, making a change. So my, my suggestion was, why don't you put the original real answer in the um, in another section of the DNS answer? So there's an answer section in the DNS answer packet, and there's an authority section or an additional uh, section. Why don't you move the answer so that all the clients who know about this can make a sensible uh, a judgment on it? So I could, for instance, say, oh, my DNS record is rewritten. Oh, but the original one is there. So I could still go to the original one if I wanted to, and it, it checks out. But apparently I shouldn't because you know I'm subscribed to this anti-malware DNS filter and it tells me I shouldn't go there. Um, but they were really persistent on only documenting existing practices, and that's unfortunately something we've seen a couple of times now in the ITF when 
when people want to make something and they don't really want the IETF to change their already existing implementation, they basically write everything outside the IETF and then when they're done, they come and submit a draft and say, we're only documenting existing, uh, existing common practices, so we want to submit this and become an RFC without you actually making any change to our document. Um, and so that's what happened in this case. So sure, I can, so for instance, to get my issue across, I can get that change into the sub successor of this document, but if nobody on the world is going to implement that RFC, then it's just sitting at the IETF doing nothing. Um, so this is one of the, the things that I wish the IETF had a better grasp on, on when people bring something really late into the IETF that we're not just rubber stamping what they're doing. Uh, I think that that is a, a growing issue at the IETF. Um, and it's similar, this is a similar case, EDNS client subnet. Some people for content uh, network management, uh, so for distributed um, loads and geography, giving different answers for different geography regions, um, they wanted the EDNS client subnet. So basically, if you have a number of uh, DNS forwarders in a chain, you can then relay who was querying for it. So you can say, oh, this was a Dutch IP, so um, you probably want to return the, you know, the web server that's closer to Holland than closer to India. Um, again, it's a good feature, but again, it has the problem that um, any ISP could still insert your IP address and sort of track you all over the world. Um, and that's not a very good from a, from a personal point of view. Um, there are ways you can say, don't do this to me, but whether, whether the upstream resolver honors that or not, you have no say about. And so this is also one of those uh, controversial, we really don't want it, but you're only documenting existing practice uh, thing. And I think this is my last slide. Um, if you want to run your own root server, um, there's now also a way to do that. Um, and there's a software implementation for it that you can use. Um, it's, people can use it to reduce the latency to the root server. It's mostly for big ISPs that uh, want to do that uh, so that they don't have latency up to the root. Um, it's, uh, and what I like about it is that if, if at any point in the future there's really a, a, a massive political conflict and uh, let's say I can remove Taiwan from the root under pressure of China and we run into weird problems like that, or uh, uh, then then you're already set up to run a root server and you can maybe uh, you know make some more local modifications to it. Um, and with that, um, there's a slide of things that are on the agenda for ITF next week. Um, so let me just quickly, uh, I'll, I'll pick out just one or two. Um, let local host be local host is about, um, uh, people were originally told to put localhost.yourdomain in the zone. So I have noads.ca. So I have an entry that says localhost.noads.ca 127.001. And some point people thought it was no longer a good idea because software shouldn't actually be resolving localhost at all. It should just know it hard-coded to never ever do that. And so there's a bit of a conflict between people who say like, yeah, we should, we should leave it like that or not. Um, so this draft basically says you should never put localhost in a DNS and any, anyone resolving localhost should know that it's, that it's special. This one, ad, um, additional answers where you can um, send one question and get multiple answers back. Uh, this can be useful if the, um, if the question you're asking is almost guaranteed to trigger you into asking another question and the, the entity answering already knows you're going to do that so they can stuff additional answers in there in, in a slightly different way from before. Um, let's see what else. Um, there's a proposal for a dot internal domain. Again, that sort of goes with the uh, with the ICANN troubles of, uh, of specifying domains. So currently that, that, um, that RFC 6761 has sort of been locked. So uh, we don't want to assign more of these domains. Um, but there's still this idea like, if we give them one domain for which they can play with and do whatever they want, then everybody can go away and we can always point to that domain. And so dot .internal is a, is a proposal for that. Um, so that's my slides. Um, does anyone have any DNS related question for me? Okay, well, if you I get one later. Oh, sure. So, uh, what would be your advice to somebody who wants to run their own resolver, uh, DNSSEC resolver, uh, because they don't trust their ISP or Google? Right, so, so what I personally do, I, on my laptop, run the unbound DNS server. 
And um, it has a, a number of features that I that I really like. Um, one of them is that it plays nicely together with uh, another piece of software called DNSSEC Trigger. So it can automatically um, reconfigure your server. So the so the unbound server on your laptop can be told to um, be a full resolve for that ask any uh, name servers on the net. But sometimes you're firewalled, right? You can only ask the local DNS server. So then you want it to configure as a forwarder, so it forwards to the local one only, but you still you still um, validate all the questions that you all the answers that you get. So you're still a full resolver, you're just sending it all to the forwarder. And the additional thing that Unbound is really good at is that um, when I connect to the VPN, so when I connect to the Red Hat VPN, um, when the the um, the Ike information for my IPsec configuration returns back and says Red Hat.com lives on these eternal internal name servers ten one two three, then I can tell Unbound, oh, add a forwarder for only Red Hat.com to this IP address, flush any answers you already have from the external Red Hat.com zone and start using the internal one. And as soon as my VPN hangs up, I go and flush everything again and remove the forward. And one thing now, you know, you mentioned on Unbound, um, we recently, in, a, in a version 164, we added an IPsec module that actually uses this IPsec key record. So if you now go to lookup um, which is the IPsec implementation I work for, um, then um, it will actually, the plugin of the DNS server, whenever it looks for an A or a quad A record, it will also look for an IPsec key record at that location. If it finds one, it will uh, tell the local Ike daemon to set up an IPsec tunnel to the remote endpoint using that public key. And only then will it return the A record to the application. So basically, I am building up IPsec tunnels opportunistically, and all the applications are not even aware of it and just automatically using the tunnel. Okay, thanks.